Well, today, our scripture lesson comes to us from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. This is a glimpse of the future. This is not something that has happened. This is something that will happen. Uh, John is given a vision, and he is shown what the future will be. So remember, as I read this, you are hearing something that's going to happen. I love the imagery. And listen to the last line of this passage, too. It's beautiful. Hear this. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship Him day and night within His temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And this is the last line. I love this. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for all the people, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Raise your hand if you have heard or seen the story where the wild things are. Yeah, it's a children's book, right? I remember uh, hearing this in a library. There's a storyteller there, and she was telling the story. Show that picture, uh, Lane. The, the story itself is not what scared me. It was the illustration that scared me. Okay. <laughs> So I was terrified by this story as a kid, and then I grew up, and they made a motion picture out of the story. And I said, I'm an adult, I can see this without freaking out. And so I saw the movie, and, out. and I freaked out. <laughs> Steve saw it coming. I was gripping on to the seat, like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? This is to so all the child of fear that I had came creeping back up. Pretty scary for me. Not the scariest thing in life, but pretty scary. A few years ago, the TV was interrupted by the news and it said that there was a tornado warning in my county. So I quickly went to the radar and noticed that there was indeed a tornado heading right toward me. So I did what any reasonable person would do. I went to the roof and took a picture of it. <laughs> took a picture of it. Yeah. yeah, pretty terrifying. So I snapped this picture and you can... You can see it, it was just barreling through Wilson, just tearing it up. There's flashes and light bulbs going on because it's tearing down all these electrical poles. You can just see debris in the air. And so I took this picture and immediately ran back downstairs and hit my bathtub like this. <laughs> but it became even more terrifying when I realized that this tornado was heading toward my future life. So I texted this picture and I said, get into your basement now. Pretty scary stuff. Not the scariest thing in life, though. If you've ever been through a big surgery, or know someone who has been through a very big surgery, the hardest part is that waiting and being told by your doctors when they sit you down and explain to you all of the risks of the surgery, all of the things that could go wrong, 
all the, the pain that's going to come from the recovery, the side effects of the medication. And by the end, you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's really terrifying. My father had a kidney transplant last year. They sent us down to us all these things. And by the end, we're thinking, oh my goodness, what are we getting ourselves into? That is scary, scary stuff. Not the scariest thing in life. Scary moment. In the fourth century in Ireland, the Celts, this is a pagan thing, they believed that on October 31st, October 31st was the last day of summer. November 1st is the first day of winter. So on October 31st, they believed that the god of death, pagan god, of course, would come out and resurrect all of the souls that had died the previous year for one last fleeing on earth. These things would be resurrected, and they would fly around the community, fly around the neighborhood. They would, it was said that they would sit in the seat that they always sat in when they had dinner. They would hang out by the fireplace that they always hung out in. They would just walk the streets, just like they did when they were alive. And they would just generally kind of fly around and, you know, haunt people. Well, that was pretty scary. I would say that's pretty scary. So here's what they did. It became so bad. The fear became so bad that they actually the townspeople would, would huddle together. They would build these giant bonfires, and they believed that the smoke and the ashes and the light would protect them from the evil spirits. It got pretty scary. Very scary. And so ultimately, the Christian church stepped in and said, everyone slow your roll. Everyone calm down. This is not real. There is no God of death. There is no souls being resurrected or haunting you. That's not how it is. Let us tell you how it is. You see, when you die, if you're a believer, you go to heaven. That's the resurrection. We don't come back and haunt you and fly around you to spook you out. And so they created this thing called All Saints Day, November 1st, to balance out the fear of Halloween. And so in the morning, after, they would celebrate all the saints who died the previous year and say, they're in heaven, praise God. And that was how the Halloween All Saints Day sort of began to happen. And it worked. Because now Halloween is not this really terrifying thing that happens on October 31st. It's a really fun thing where kids dress up in cute costumes and we have trunk or treats and I carve pumpkins with UNC on it. It's fun and the real thing is the resurrection. The real thing is the celebration of all the saints who are in heaven now. A beautiful, beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. And so we have John kind of giving us a glimpse of the future kind of showing us what the future will be like. And he paints this imagery of saints in white robes. And I love that the Christian church embraces death. I love that we communicate to the world that death is not this horrible, awful thing that is actually the beginning of your perfection in God's glory. That it is a beautiful place where God is and we can be with God and we can rest and we can relax and we can have every tear wiped away. Yes, the Christian church is that light in this dark world. We are that celebration on October 31st. You know, in some Eastern Orthodox churches out in Europe, they form their entire architecture around the saints in heaven. And what they'll do is they... Instead of like these long Gothic buildings, they'll have these domes over the congregation, just kind of right over us. And inside these domes, they'll paint pictures of the saints in heaven. 99% of the time, those saints are wearing white robes. We get that from Revelation. It also says in Revelation that these people who are wearing the white robes also have the sign of God on their forehead. They're referring to baptism. They're referring to baptism. They're saying, if you've been baptized, if you've given your life to Christ, if you belong to God, God knows you. God hasn't forgotten you. You will be with God in heaven. 
And that's the, the great thing about reading Revelation. You know, sometimes we read Revelation and it's all spooky and scary. Thank you, Left Behind series, for doing that to us. But Revelation is a book of hope. It's a vision of hope. It shows us the future. It shows us that God remembers who we are. I think the scariest thing in life not a movie, you know, it's, it's not tornadoes, it's not even big surgeries or fear of pain and death. I think ultimately the scariest thing that we endure is this idea, and some people have this, this is a real fear, is this idea that they don't matter. That their existence, their life means nothing, they live, they work, they do their thing, and then when they die their name just fades away. The sad existence. The good news is that John tells us in Revelation that God remembers our name. God knows who we are. We are not forgotten. We are never forgotten. Sometimes in the mornings when I'm drinking my cup of coffee, I'll use one of Lindsay's old high school mugs. It says, uh, Garner High School, Class of 2000. And on the back side, it has the name of all 500 people she graduated with. How can you fit 500 names in a mug? By making it really, really small. <laughs> I can barely read them. But I, I went to the same high school, and I, I noticed some of the people on this mug, and I'll, I'll be drinking my coffee, and I'll think, oh, uh, yeah, I remember them. Parking lot. Yeah, 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 okay. But it's, a kind, of, it's kind of a cool mug. Why is it so cool? Because every name is on there. Every name is on that mug. No one was forgotten. Show the next picture, Wayne. Uh, the fourth most popular sport in America is hockey. Hockey. How many of you like hockey? It's about right. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, in hockey, they have the first most popular trophy. Why would the fourth most popular sport have the first most popular trophy? Because the Stanley Cup is unique. And the Stanley Cup, the trophy, if you've ever won the Stanley Cup, even if you were the bench warmer, the guy that didn't play a single minute, your name gets carved onto that trophy. Every single name that won a championship is from that trophy. There have been all-time great hockey players Hall of Famers. But we don't know who they are. You know why? Because they didn't win, and their name's not a trophy. The Stanley Cup is unique because no one is forgotten. Every name is on that trophy. A few years ago, I went to Washington, D.C. with my wife. It's the end of December, it was 30 degrees, frigid. But we wanted to walk by the Vietnam Memorial. Show that next picture, Wayne. We could only spend a few moments here because it was so cold. But I was just amazed. It was my first time seeing it. I was amazed by how long it was and how wide it was in the middle and how tiny the names were. You can see how small they are for that hand. It's amazing how many names are there. We were only there for a few moments, but you know, I saw people walking along with their hands, kind of just filling out the names. People just standing there, just mesmerized by the whole wall. Some people getting emotional. Why is this Vietnam Memorial so meaningful to our country? Because every name of every fallen soldier in that war is on that wall. No one was forgotten. No one was forgotten. Again, I say to you, it matters that we are not forgotten. It matters that God knows our name. I grew up with a guy whose name was William Williams. We were in the same grade, had a lot of the same classes. And every year, at the beginning of every semester, the teacher would be doing the role, right? And his name was at the bottom. And they would look at his name and say, oh, must be a typo. He said, no, that's me. <laughs> and she said, your first name's William? Yeah. Last name's Williams? Yeah. I'm 
sorry. <laughs> every year, every year, same thing. We'd always laugh and kind of pick up William Williams. But here's the thing. God loves our name. God loves our name. I just imagine God being like the parent of an unborn child. When, you know how parents are, are picking out names, and they think they got one, and they're, they're saying it over and over again to see how it sounds. Just over and over again. I just imagine God sort of saying our name like a breath prayer. Just saying it, because our name, the uniqueness of our name, reminds him of how uniquely we were made by him. God knows every syllable of our name. He knows the full name. He can say it in Spanish. He can even pronounce your weird last name. <laughs> God, he knows your name. He knows your name. You are not forgotten. You are not alone. You will... Be remembered by your Creator. In baptism, which is referenced in Revelation, pastors always make it a point to say the full name of the person they're baptizing. It's our way of saying, God, this person is yours. They belong to you. May your grace be with them. Lord, don't forget their name. 